Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 25th of the first month on our Creator's calendar as we comprehend it, tomorrow being first fruits. And uh, it, that corresponds with, what are we, April 6th on the Gregorian calendar for the year 2024. And we're continuing with our reading of Bereshit or Genesis, currently on chapter 35. Just for a little recap of what we've recently covered, Jacob had gone out fleeing from his brother to um, go get a wife for himself from his amongst the family, right? He went to Laban, whose name means white. He was a Syrian or an Aramean, as we call them. And he stayed with him for quite a long time, 14 years for his wives and another uh, seven at least for his possessions there. And during the course of that, he had 11 children. <clears throat> and he also gained a great many possessions, all of them streaked, spotted, speckled, nothing pure white, nothing pure black. All of it parables for things that we've talked about a little bit before, so we don't want to get into too much of that right now. But he labors for his possessions and while he's out in the world, his family has some issues. There's contentions amongst his wives. There's contentions amongst the children, right? But first it's in the wives and in there having the children and then in his interactions with Laban. And even that, the things that he was suffering corresponded with things that he had already done. Remember, that goes in line with his name, Jacob, Jacob there, when you look at Jacob, it comes from Ayan Kof Beit, which is the heel, footprint or hind part, literally um, what comes at the heel. It also means to recompense. See, it's the consequence or it's because of. It's what happens because of a thing, literally what happens at the heel of the thing you're doing. And that's essentially what his name means for us and for our purposes. Um, when it comes to believers, specifically, originally, the kingdom of Yahuda in foretelling is called Yaakob, while the northern kingdom is called Ephraim or Yisrael, Israel, right? But um, back on point, Yaakov is what comes at the heel of what you're doing, and that's literally what you can see in his life as a thing for us to learn from. Those that are not maliciously evil, that don't plot evil things in their hearts on their bed against their brothers, they have what they deserve coming at them more expediently, especially when they are not um, in, incited to it through... Um, necessity or compulsion like if someone isn't threatening you you go rob this for me or i'm going to kill your family right or you know you're starving so you still have to provide for them those kind of means you're not directly punished you know right off the bat it's kind of delayed but if you do things like as a child i went into a grocery store and i just decided because I felt like it to steal a cap gun. And I made a scene of putting it in my bag. I wanted to see, you know, just what would happen. And as I was walking out, I got caught. And man immediately got in trouble. So um, that kind of thing happened to me all the time because I was not maliciously evil, but I did stupid things. So I got in trouble quite often, expediently, almost immediately after I did this thing. And it taught me not to do dumb things. So that's the whole purpose of it. <clears throat> but we can miss that when we can take these corrections and not learn from them, which is something that he goes on and on about throughout the foretellers, about how we we get ground down and we just, or like what's in the Proverbs, right? The fool could be crushed in a mortar along with the pestle and crushed grain, and his folly will not leave him, right? So the idea is we're going to suffer the things that we do wrong, Exactly like our forefather here, exactly like our ancestors that came after, we will be corrected for our inequities in this life. 
and that's supposed to help us turn <clears throat> to be more pure and to repent just as we see throughout the entirety of what we call the scriptures so that being said he came back into the land now and he's having to deal with the consequences of their actions not only was there contentions and fightings amongst the family or amongst the women but rachel had stolen the idols and um there was lying going on dece deceiving and what happens they come back he's accosted by laban he has to make the covenant what we don't see is they later purify themselves we'll get to that when he comes to the book of yobelim but um for our purposes here they return to the land they make propitiation or have to send tribute to esau to appease him before being able to come in now and then after they came in after they're in the land before he's been able to fulfill his vow his daughter was defiled and then we have what happened there with what we read last week so all those things being accomplished now he's here he has what's left of his goods and he's going to be able to keep his vow excuse me and again in the book of yobelim or what they call jubilees these things are given other details things and more specifically all of these specific dates on which they land are pointed out and you find that significant appointed times are all throughout the their uh the events that they're walking out here same thing with the exodus and what the children walked out when they were being delivered out of egypt if you will and the same thing with what our Mashiach walked out when he came and he delivered us from the sin of bondage, literally on the appointed times. So here we go. This is chapter 35, and it says, And he said, right, way yo mer, right? Normally this would be amar or amer, right? They say omer because of the holum. And they make the aleph make an o sound in reality you would have diphthongs or conjunctions of letters that would approximate that but that's for a different time but this is and which is the wa and then the yod here with the dot is a dogish when you do that it doubles the letter that's why you see it say way and then yo because that's doubled okay so it's way yomer and he said elohim to yaakob comb like the comb on an e on a rooster's head that stands up that's what it means arise right go up it says go up bethel and dwell washem right there remember we mentioned shem that's the word for name but it also means name fame character reputation what you're known for where you're at literally here or there which you see right here it's translated there and this is in and dwell there in the, at bethel right and make there a place of sacrifice which is an altar okay to l who appeared to you had nara it's the 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 appearing one or the one you saw right to you when you fled from the face so this is literally when you go through or when you flee okay ba rek ba rech but they say kh others will put ch uh, there's a gentleman eric bissell brother from erictology on the uh, youtube channel there he has quite a few videos he'll put cx for the different pronunciation of the way to to get an english um transliteration of that ph phonetic there in reality both the cough what we call a k and this hey 
which the letter became our H, but the sound is a CH or a guttural. Um, it changes, it softens or it hardens based on what word you use it in or where it's used, possibly as the verb tense. I'm still learning all the nuances. But the point is, and a thing that I was trying to mention last week, we can't really be dogmatic about, oh, it must be pronounced this way because the hard guttural can soften. It does it in um, ruach, ruach. It's not ruach, really, really, ah, really hard. It's a softening of it, but it is still a guttural. And then just like barak can be barak, and that's just the cough, but it's a, it's a, it's the uh, roughening up, if you will, in the throat. I'm not, I'm not familiar with what that's called at the moment, so I'm sorry for that. But either way, it's just the way we can't be dogmatic about that. These have peculiar pronunciations. I'm not really trying to be stickler on it, but I'm trying to point out how these words break down. So this is the word to see right here, Rush Aleph Hey. The hey noon is like the, and then the noon is like a lightning bolt or a fish's tail in the water. It's an action of doing the thing. It literally, the letter noon, lines up with the creation account for the moon, which is constantly in motion with its waxing and waning. Okay, that's the picture of what a noon is. And when you see it in a word, that's how it's being used. So like the ha nua, it's the one who, boom, he appeared to you and he was there, right? And our Mashiach both instantly appears, like we'd say teleports, if you will, or just suddenly manifests into visibility. And he will also disappear like he's done with his taught ones. He also teleports them. He's moved them before. Or you can see he will. he's the one that is ascending. And he goes up or down into the Shemaim of his own volition, not, not by the permission of another. <clears throat> and it says, when you fled from the face of Ishu or Esau, Achi, Achika, Achika, right? Your brother. It says, and he said, Jacob, to his house, right? Beto, right? And to all who, which, that, and all that were with him, right? Put away, eth, elohi, na, or han, nikar, the foreign, right? We'll look at that. This is to turn aside, sure, right? Not put away, but to do away, to escape right, to depart from, it's what you're doing, so they have it as turn aside, or put away, right, and if I remember, yeah, that which is foreign, or foreignness, nikar, yeah. and this is misfortune, or calamity, is what that means, so you go back here, you put away, that which is a calamity or misfortune, which is alluding to the very things that they just had happen to them. Not only did he have to propitiate his brother, not to have him angry coming back in, he had to make a covenant with Laban who was pursued by him, but then his daughter was defiled. And now he's like, put away the things that are causing calamity, that are foreign, which are among you. And purify yourselves to be clean and pure. Tahar, right? It says very clearly in the third commandment that he will not purify or cleanse the one who lifts up, bears, or carries his name to not a lie, falsehood, fabrication, or ruin. It doesn't say that he will certainly punish or he will not leave unpunished. It says, but he will not purify or clean which gives a whole different meaning. It says, and in change your garments, okay? These are all pictures. They literally did these things, and then they're foretelling what we are going to have to do on our return when he's coming back. Just like we've mentioned multiple times, he's coming back for a spotless bride. 
if we want to not die, and this is for any believer that's alive, he says, if you believe in me and you're living, you shall never taste death at all. Do you believe this? The premise there was that those that are going to be alive at his coming have to have the same disposition as those who have never tasted death at all throughout history, like Enoch or Hanok, Eliyahu, Baruch, and Ezra. Hanok you can learn about in the book of Enoch and the book of Yobelim or Jubilees, also attested to in what is called, or in Genesis here, Bereshit, right? Um, Eliyahu, also attested to in the book of Yobelim in the animal apocalypse, who he was taken to be with Hanok there, and in the scriptures, Kings and Chronicles, right? Then you have the uh, Baruch being promised to be kept to the consummations of the times in second Baruch and Ezra, not only why, not only that they'll be kept to these times, but why, what it was about them that made them precious in his eyes and to be continued until he returns. Everyone that's going to be alive and never dying has to have that same disposition that they had because he's not impartial. He doesn't change. He doesn't play favorites. He's not a hypocrite. He's perfect in his judgment, right? And that's the part of purifying ourselves here. Some people, from what I've gathered, just to be fully, and this is part of counting the costs. He mentions that the one, when you come to the truth, you have to make, he gives the parable of the one who builds a tower and you count to make sure you have what you need before you start the building so you're not ashamed or embarrassed that you couldn't finish. The idea here, if you've done something in your life that requires a death sentence in his Torah, your, your life is forfeit. You have no expectation of continuing it after you become a believer, right? It's by his favor alone that you, you live and are just like everybody else, but these are the things you actually have a death sentence by the word already established. Things that do that are, are given, kidnapping, murdering the innocent, right? Doing, uh, dishonoring your parents, right? There's things that were liable to cause stoning, right? Witchcraft. These are things that you have to repent of that you, there's consequences for I don't want to get into all the details for that, but that's part of, you know, the purifying yourselves, getting your garments right. You have to expect and reasonably know what you have in store for you, right? You can still be a believer. You can live a long time. The more you dedicate yourself to him and sharing the truth, the, the more he'll use you in this life and you can preserve it, right? Shaul's a great example of that. His life was forfeit for the things that he had chosen to do, but his dedication to sharing the word kept him alive for quite some time although he was not without correction for the things he'd already done. He suffered greatly for his namesake, if you remember, as an example to the martyrs. And again, in the Shepherd of Hermas, it's explained unequivocally that if the martyrs, the people that were turning from the mystery religions that would regularly do ritual sacrifices of men, they had to die. They had committed sentences that cause death and while they were forgiven they had to be corrected in this life so a father willing things will start making more sense to everybody and we can reasonably with intelligence count the cost and do his will expecting what we have coming and enduring patiently in love that's the whole point <clears throat> but back on track here it says then let us arise and go up, right, to Beth El, the house of El, and I will make, right, and it says, and I, this is, and is the wa, I is the aleph, remember, aleph as a prefix means I will or I do, or sorry, I will or I am, and then eshe, ayin, sheen, he is a deed. It's what you do. It's a, to do or make a thing, right? Ma'ase is the book of Acts, or the 
the book of deeds, the things they did, for example. But he says, and I will make there an altar to El, who answered, Ha'ana, right? Remember Bethany, or the house of the poor is also the place of an answer. It's a related word. But who answered Aleph Tau Yod, which they translate as me. Beyond in the day of my distress. That word is like czar, where you get Caesar or Kaiser. That's one of the words for distress, and it's related to the word for a king or a sovereign, a hard place or a rock. Right? Straits or distress. But it says, in the day of my distress, and has been, why he, right? And he has caused to be made evident and claimed as his own with me in the way, bederek, okay? Which I have gone, that's helakoti, right? That is a suffix, but that laka is to go, to walk, right? <clears throat> This is related to the word Nathan, Wayatnu, right? It says, and he gave, or so he gave, <laughs> unto Yaakov, Eth, Aleph Tal, all the mighty ones of calamity or misfortune that were in, the, in their hands, right? The mem at the end means them or theirs. Bet as a suffix means in, with, or among. And then the yad right there is the word for hand. So in their hand, all one word there. <clears throat> says wa'eth and the earrings, hanazanim. This one is interesting, and you'll see that a lot more, but it's literally nizem is a ring. Worn as an ornament. People might not get the significance of that, but the ringed one or the Lord of the Rings was another title for Satan. Not Satan, um, Saturn, <laughs> which is Satan. That's a different thing. But um, Saturn was the Lord of the Rings. So the wearing the earring or the earrings or the wedding rings or the other rings or all these bands and bindings were uh, things that had to do with stuff that was related to the ringed planet or the ah, seven yeah. one, just for context there. And what was originally part of like keeping an oath and doing those things, it turned paganized. The symbolism became occultic and um, it's just not something that was profitable. And you can see here, it was something that was literally repented of while they were purifying themselves of all the things that were foreign and caused calamity. But it says, and their rings, right, that were in their ears, which is called, they call them ear rings, right? And hid them, Jacob, under the terebinth that was by Shechem. So the terebinth trees of Moray, it mentions in Yobelim that he ground the idols into powder he burnt them and ground them into powder and hid them, buried them under the terebinth trees of Moray. Okay, but this is uh, that were by Shechem. This is, and they journeyed, right, to pull out or set up again. Okay, so, and they set out and was the terror of Elohim upon the cities that were all around them. You remember that Yaakov, after Louis and Shimon, or Levi and Simon, had risen up and taken out the men that circumcised themselves with Shechem. Then their, the rest of their brothers helped them out. They destroyed the city and plundered their goods. Their father was upset that they would be a stench in the nostrils of the, those around them. But our Creator put the fear, His terror, of Elohim. Right? Chata, like the Hittites, right? The terrorists, if you will. Yeah, he put the terror of them upon the cities that were all around them. Sabib Tihem or Tehem. Sabibotehem. All right. 
and lo, or never did they pursue Ahri after them, right after the sons Bene Yaakov. Remember, I was telling you, whenever it means the sons of, they'll have the sere here. That's the two dots below this middle letter. This happens to be the noon. But these two dots are the sere and then the yod. That always makes the a sound, bene, or whatever a, and that usually denotes whatever of, and then it's of the next word. When they have melech, I don't know if they put messengers of Yahuwah with that vowel point or not, and I don't know why. Um, it might have been to hide the fact that one of them didn't have it, or it might be a phenomenon with how that worked with the language itself. I tend to believe that the things that cause confusion are not of our creator, but were added or taken from. If you remember, our Mashiach walked out the truth, how men regarded his word through history. And while he was abused and mistreated by his own, which we have evidence of the facts, the facts that they removed stuff, they added things, they tampered with texts to uh, to hide stuff to their own people. They, they, they deluded themselves and falsehood was the reward because they were cursed and his name was literally taken out of their mouths. Just like he said, just like he said before he returns, he says, you will by no means see me again until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Yahuwah, or blessed is he who is coming in the name of Yahuwah. So, it's what is. We just we don't want to argue or fight or be contentious, but we want to be honest, both with ourselves and with everybody else, right? So this is all about us now. This is all about what's going on. We're a terror to them. We're trying to come back to the truth. We're purifying ourselves. We're getting things right before he keeps his vow. This is part of what <clears throat> is like the three you know, the three ages before the end. He is getting his possessions and returning all about what our Mashiach was doing that was directly spoken of again in the recognitions of Clement. Kepha says that he came in his first coming like unto Moshe and in the aspect of Yaakov because he came like unto Moshe in all things, delivering the people from bondage of sin like, like the spiritual Egypt that they were in. And like Yaakov, <clears throat> the Basora was being taken out of the land to flee from the persecution of his brother while providing his possessions and his children before returning, which is literally what we're living through right now with the what you call the good news, the Bible, the Basora being spread throughout the world. It was propagated by the blind and the lame that he carried, as foretold, when Ephraim and Manasseh were repenting, what we call the Reformation. And then what they did is they brought the Bible to every continent, to every peoples, not every single one, but all kinds, just as it was foretold. And now we're in the after effects of that kind of thing. But it's it, all of this is meant to literally get us to to take his words seriously. Not English translations, but what he really said, because those are that's what has meaning. But he's a terror all around, and no pursue rada, radfu, right? Radefu. They, they say radefu, but that's not how you'd pronounce that. The anytime you have a half vowel in the second place that closes a syllable so that'd be rad fo or rad fu but that's not important right now this is they pursued after the sons of yaakov right and he came they say so came but and he came yaakov lose to lose right which in the land canaan so which is in the land of canaan who Remember, who means he, but it also, they say, is that. Okay? So, that is in Bethel. Or that is the house of El. 
It says he, Wakol, and all Ha'am, the people which were with him. And he built, related to the word son, right? And he built there an altar. And Yaakov, it says, La Mekum, he established, this is the place there, right? But that is unto the means of standing, right? A standing place. Okay, you can see how it's translated there. But he said, and he called that standing place, right, the El of Bethel. And that El of Bethel is literally um, the part of that Bethel stone, which is Jacob's pillow. There's a whole tradition behind it with the Irish and how it was carried by Tay Taffy. There's a whole other tradition in the ancient history of Caledonia, where it was taken by Dardanus and the righteous remnant of the Hebrews in Egypt that left before the murders of the firstborn, and they founded the city of Troy. So they they had what they called Jacob's Pillow with them all the way through their sojournings to what we call Scotland today. And then Tay Taffy mentions that she took Jacob's Pillow so whether that was one stone broken in two that was given each one to Peretz and one to uh, Zara's line, I can't say with any certainty. What I can say with certainty is that what they call Yobscope's pillow, that they can trace all the way from Egypt, from the ancient history of Caledonia, is still in the throne of Westminster today. And um, <clears throat> it's a rather interesting phenomenon. But it's another proof of who we are, who the royalty is of pretty much most all of the monarchs and leadership of the world being of Yahuda, because it was foretold that that would be so. This is uh, the place of El the Bethel for or because there it says appeared to uncover or remove Gela, right? It says, banish, betray, captivity, so to lay bare, known, right? These are revelation, uncover. This is, you can get an idea of what this means. For he uncovered himself or laid himself bare there. And that's why it was the house of El. If you remember, he had a dream where he saw a ladder with Melikim or messengers ascending and descending upon Yahuwah. Now, if you have any recollection or if you're not familiar, you can look at the introduction of Yahushua to Nathaniel. And he says, because he says, I saw you under the, the tree, the fig tree, right? And he says, my sovereign and my Elohim. Or no, no, no. He knew who he was. He says, you are the king of Israel. And he says, or Yisrael, right? He says, do you believe because I said this? Truly, you shall see messengers ascending and descending upon the son of Adam, pointing out who that was that was appearing to Yaakov back then as well. But he's the one that uncovered himself or made himself known and or appeared here to him, the Elohim. Again, we've seen this throughout Genesis. It's not in every place, but Ham Elohim is when it's talking about the Elohim is the Father as identified in the Son who appears to men, right? Is when he fled Mepine from the face of, all right, the brother of him or his brother. Wa tamot, so and dead, right, and died. That tau makes it a past tense or something that's, you know, it happened, right? And died Deborah, the nurse of Rebecca. It, I don't know if it mentions that Dina dies as well here, but in the book of Yobelim, it mentions that after. <clears throat> 
both. Oh, no, that's afterwards. Sorry. I'm confusing things. When oh, it might be Deborah, I'll have to double check. But after Yahusif is taken and they have that issue, the uh, Dina dies and so does Bilha. That's who it is. I'm sorry. So, spoiler alert for anyone who didn't know. But the women that were partakers of the covenant, they have different meanings. And when they die in these things, everything is foretelling events that would happen if we would only know what they meant and how, how it can be comprehended. The nuances of these things are not explained clearly, but shown throughout scripture and then explained in detail in a little bit here and a little bit there. The whole premise, for example, Yishmael, the wild donkey man, being of the first covenant believers, is based off of what Shaul, or Paul, says about Hagar being representative of the first covenant in Mount Sinai in Arabia. He directly alludes to that, and Sarah being of the renewed covenant through which Yitzhak, the promised seed, was birthed right? A type of the promised seed to come. His birth, just like Yahudah's, the name, you know, the one through whom the kingdom was given, which line our Mashiach was going to come from, both of them born on the 15th of the third month, the same time every covenant was given. So all of these things are significant, the same here, but this is less clear when we don't know what the women represent. But if you do, then you do. So, and you find that in Yobelim in the definitions of words too. What a make, what a woman is, what a mother is, and what a metropolis or city is, and why they were named that way, we will get to in the course of time. It's in Yobelim and everything. But that's what these are alluding to. Okay. And it says in. Uh, and died Deborah, the nurse of Rebekah, and was buried, okay, below, this says below, that's in the, right, underneath, under the house of El, under the oak, so it was called the name of it, the oak of Deborah, right? or the Oak of Weeping, sorry. The other one says the Oak of Deborah, but this is the Oak of Weeping, Bach Uth. Remember that Bet Koth is like Bokim, is to weep, okay? <clears throat> so right here it says, And appeared Elohim to Yaakov again. When he came, it says, And in his coming from Padanaram, and he barak him, Aleph Tau, him, right? That word for the was is the word for him. That's why they say the wa or the sixth letter is the letter of a man. There's the connection there. This is, and he said unto him, Elohim, your name, Yaakov, never or no, Yaakov, your name, anymore, right? Yaakov it says, for since Yishrael, Yahya, or shall be, literally he caused it to be, he caused it to be, or he's making it manifest, right? Your name. And he proclaimed, or he called at his name, Yisrael, Israel, they say. It's he is, or he will, right? That's a prince, is a shar of El. And then Yashar is also to, can, to strive or contend. That's why they get that. He will contend or he will strive with men and Elohim and overcome. Or he is the prince of El. It has it as both ways. It, it literally says he will strive with Elohim and with men and overcome in Genesis here. And then when you look at, in the Masoretic versions of Genesis, and when you look at the um, Septuagint, or the Greek translation, it literally calls him a prince of El, as the meaning of what this is. So it's legitimately both. And these words literally 
mean both? Okay, right here from Sarah and El. When you look at this one, it is Sheen Resh He, to persist, exert oneself, or preserve, to strive or contend, they say, right? And then you have the Yod as a prefix. So literally meaning that, and it's literally meaning a prince. Right, back, back on track here. Oh, sorry about that. So he said, and he said unto him, Elohim, I am the El Shaddai. The same thing that he said when he appeared as a man, but speaking through the voice of the Father to Abraham. He said, I am El Shaddai, walk you before me and be you perfect, right? So now he says to him, the one who appeared and he's able to see him, right? Speaking with the authority of the Father here. He says, I am El Shaddai, Peru Oribu, right? They say the same thing that he said to Adam in the beginning. Be fruitful and multiply. Goy. People want to say that the Goyim are bad, right? They, but it's a nation of people. Goy. Goy wa kahal. So a nation and an assembly. They say a, and a company. But that kahal, remember, is the assembly or the congregation of Elohim. Reads a little different there. A nation and an assembly of nations, right, shall proceed from you. And kings from your loins shall come. Yah, the book of Yobelim gives that even more specific, okay? And it differentiates who gets the Baraka of the kingdom directly to Yahuda, but that doesn't that doesn't say that the nations are only his. Although there are nations of Yahuda, just like there's nations just from Ephraim, and there's the great nation of Manasseh there, but Manasseh is a half tribe. It's split into two. Dan, if you will, is Ireland and Denmark. Gad, Spain, and South America or Mexico. You got the, the whole peoples where they spread, and you also have the Spanish, <clears throat> excuse me, the Spaniards who went and integrated, if you will, with the Philippines and the people of the Philippines who, while of Yefeth, of their own, you know, of their own separate group of people, from the time of Shalomo, they had an intermixture, inter intermixture rather, of Hebrews because the Philippines, there's great evidence for it, are what scripture calls the Ophir, the land of gold. It was literally known as the Isles of Gold in Antiquity. But the largest island was named after the white bearded Phoenicians that would come trade with them goods for gold. And that was during the reign of Shalomo. The Phoenicians were just Hebrews that were paganized, that were working with Hebrews that were not. <clears throat> but it says, And a nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings from your loins shall come. And the land, Haaretz, which I gave Abraham unto Abraham, and unto Yitzach, unto you, Atanu, or Antane, right? That's I give to you. And unto your seed. It says your descendants, but that's Zerah, right? That's unto your seed. After you, I give. Eth Ha'aret, so Aleph Tal, that's his land that he's giving, which it mentions in Yobelim again, that it was not given so much as returned to Abraham. It was the land allotted to Shem that was taken by force and violence, if you will, by the sons of Ham. If you recall, it was both taken from Babylon and the land of Canaan on from the Canaanites. But um, Nimrod, his descendants were still ruling in Babylon. And his son, for anyone that is interested, if you want information about what was going on in those times, there's the history by Diodorus Siclorus, or Seclorum, if that's his name, I can't really pronounce it correctly. But he's a Roman historian who went over the antiquities and histories of the different peoples at the times. And while 
some of it is fanciful. A lot of it is also describing real history about things that were going on. And if you know who's being spoken of, um, it makes a lot more sense. So Nimrod's actually spoken of quite prevalently there. What he was doing, conquering different places and setting stuff up. Macedonia was actually named after his son, Macedon, who he sent to reign over there. But that wasn't just uh, all sons of Ham that were living there. It was just who was in charge, if you will. Um, there's a lot more involved in that, but long story short, it was being returned to them what was unlawfully taken when they had separated things by lot and swore oaths that they would not take what belonged to others, if you recall. And as we will cover again, it's mentioned both in Genesis, um, the book of Yobelim, and in the Dead Sea Scrolls in what they call the Genesis Apocryphon, or the writings about Genesis that are um, in addition to it, because it's not word for word the same text. It says, and went up, that's Al-Wayala, right? And he went up from him, Elohim. This is the phenomenon that our Mashiach does. He's the one that will go up, ascend or descend, that men can perceive, that does it of his own volition, right? And he is the Elohim that was sent from the Father. <clears throat> but he, and he went up from Elohim in the place where Debar Ethu, where he talked Aleph Tau him, okay? And he set up, or and he established, Yaakov, a pillar. In the place where he talked with him, okay? Remember, Aleph Tau also means with, literally. And the English, as the language was changing, they had a hard time with the gutturals. The ayin and the Aleph became Ws quite often. And that's where we get the word with, would, woden, for example, back there for add on instead. And there's quite a few other words that that happened with. So I don't want to repeat these things too many times, but I'm trying to show for anyone that's interested, there is a great amount of evidence, if you take the time to look into it, from archaeology, genetics, um, the written record and the linguistics linguistics itself that point to the facts of who we are right this is in Jacob, a pillar in the place or so he set up Jacob, a pillar in the place where he talked with him the pillar of stone at evan that's where we get the word for even right but it's a perfect weight or to be balanced right and he poured on it a drink offering, and he poured on it oil, shemen. So he anointed the stone, and that stone was actually used as an altar in the ancient history of Caledonia by the sons of Louis, where they were sacrificing on it to make propitiation and to inquire of Yahuwah, and they had no other altars to use. So it was anointed and set apart for purpose, and it has been dedicated the entire time. It says, and he called Yaakov Eth, the name of the place where it spoke with him, Shem, there, right? Elohim, Bethel, the house of El. And now we see the consequences of the idolatry of stealing the idols and lying about it. it didn't have to be this way but these are the things that happened because of what happened okay and they journeyed from bethel and when there was but a little right a, a little of the land to go unto coming ephrath right and travailed to bear, bring forth, begat, right? They put travail here. And begat Rachel and was difficult, her labor, okay? This is to be hard, severe, or fierce. Kesha.
So, and it was difficult, her labor. And it came to pass when she was hard in labor that she said unto her, the midwife, not do not fear for also this unto you a son. So the midwife said to her, do not be afraid for, you know, you're having a son. And so it was, as was departing her nephesh, right, her inner being, for she died, that she called his name Shemu ben Oni, right, the the son of my inequity, Avon, right, but they said the son of my sorrow, trouble, sorrow, wickedness. Wickedness, this is the word for inequity right here in the KJV, right? So the son of my inequity, the son of my sorrow. But his father called unto him Ben Yamim, which is either the son of the son of my days, right? The son of long days, or the son of my right hand. Both of them significant for foretelling purposes because he was the youngest that he had in his old age and he was like the son of his right hand for the purposes of pointing out things prophetically, if you will. <clears throat> so died Rachel, Rachel and was buried on the way to Ephrath. That is the house of El, or, or sorry, that is the, the house of bread, Bethlehem, right? And set up Yaakov a pillar on her grave. That is the pillar of her grave of Rachel to this day, right? Ad Hayam witnessed as far as even to up and tell or when, right? Even to or tell perpetuity, right? But I was hoping that you can see there's the, the, the word that, that this literally means witness. It's also booty and pray. There we go. Ed is also a witness. So it means all of these things. I and Dalit is literally your... Um, a witness is also someone who testifies. And your testifies is related to your tests of coals. When he reaches his hand up under his thigh and he swears, right? He, he's given a testimony that is true. Those are the pictures behind those words, just so you're familiar. I'm not trying to be gross or anything. And journeyed Yisrael and pitched his tent beyond, right? This is, says um, Magdal. Adar, so the Tower of Edar. There you go. Migdal is a tower. So beyond under the Tower of Edar. And it came to pass when he dwelt Yisrael in the land. Hahu, that's properly that. Usually if it's just who, it means he. But Hahu is the he, which is that, right? So it says that he went in Reuben and lay at and lay with Ath Bilhah, the concubine of his father, or the you know the maidservant that was given to him. She was the mother of Dan and Gad. It says and heard about it Yisrael. You also hear about this in Yobelim and the Testament of Reuben, specifically. And were the sons of Yaakov two and ten, or twelve, the sons of Leah, firstborn of Yaakov, Reuben, and Shimon, and Louis, and Yahuda, and Yishakar, and Zebulun. And this is what I was talking about here. You have Zebulun, but this wa in between the Lamed and the, the Noon. They don't have it. They they remove that wa and they put the kibbutz here. These three dots, which makes the u sound. But this is just one more example of the defective spelling for the word. Right. It says the sons of Rachel, Yahusuf, 
Wa Benjamin and Benjamin. And the sons of Bilhah, maidservant of Rachel or Rachel. Dan, I'm sorry, it was not Gad. It's Dan and Naphtali, rather. And if you pay attention to who was born to who, you have the idea, this echoing pattern, the firstborn rejection, acceptance of the second kind of thing. Um, not, not to be mean to anybody. I'm not trying to be disrespectful about what tribe's coming from where or who belongs to what. The, the point is, there's echoes in history. There's patterns that you can see all the way from the beginning where you have Adam kill himself and he's rejected, right? But there's an Adam that's going to come. Then you have it play out in his son where Cain kills his brother. So he's rejected, but Set is put in his place. And then you have that, ah, uh, but the children of Noah reject themselves, but Abraham is chosen. And then, ah, uh, well, it's not, Yishmael, but Yitzhak, and then oh, it's not Esau, but Yaakov, and it's oh, it's not Ephra, or it's not Manasseh, but Ephraim. It's that echo, 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 and you even see it in Yahuda's children, where it's not Zerah, but Peretz, and then that actually switches back with the uh, transfer of the kingdom. So it's that echo of the firstborn rejection, acceptance of the second. You can see it in the pattern of the children as well, who was first rejected. Right. And in this one, you have not only it, the first two houses, <laughs> Reuben and Shimon, but then the next two were accepted, Louis and Yahuda, Kahuna kingdom. Right. Then you have Dan rejected, Naphtali accepted, Gad rejected the other. I think it was. Uh, where is it? Uh, well, we'll get, yeah, see, Gad rejected, Asher accepted. There you go. You have in these ones generally, you'll find that Dan and Gad were more in line to persecute along with Reuben, or not not always just Reuben. There was difference there too, but he was in line with the sons of Louis that went apostate. The point is they were more uh, inclined to persecute Yahusuf when they were selling him to slavery and the things that were going on in their childhood because of the infighting of the, the parents that carried down. And that led out to their children in a greater scale, doing the persecutions once amongst each other um, and how that's played out in history. So th there's something to be mindful to that. But there's enough of us at this point in our lives that we have a lot of probably every tribe intermarry through all the others. You, you literally have at your fingertips the ability to choose to repent to to hear his word to turn to him in sincerity and truth or to not do so it's not something that i believe is dogmatic oh someone has to be a certain way anymore in this life just because of the prevalence of the repentance in genetics in the dna but that's a different thing for for another time if you know about abraham's story and his the children coming from him he repented. It carries down in the genes as those are the ones that will repent while others did not wiped out. There's kind of a picture here. So something for us to keep in mind. <clears throat> this is, and the sons of Zilpha, the maidservant of Leah, were Gad and Asher. These, the sons of Jacob, who or which were born, right, unto him, in Padanaram. All right. And then we're almost done. We'll, we'll just finish up this chapter here and we'll, we'll be all right. But it says this is the death of Yitzhak. And you have a condensed version of what was taking quite a bit of time here. It doesn't show his vow being kept at all, but that would have been preceding this by quite a bit. Um, his father got to live for some time and enjoy his company after his return. And he died at 185 living past his father by 10 years, if you remember. And came Jacob to Yitzhak, his father, from Mamre, or at Mamre. That's the place of Mamre, right? Kiriath Araba, or Kiriath Ha Araba, that is in Hebron, where had dwelt, 
right? Or we're a sojourn there, Abraham and Yitzhak. Remember, Gar is a sojourner. And where the days of Yit, or sorry, and where the days of Yitzhak, a hundred years and eighty years. So it just says 180. The other one says 185, I believe. So breathe his last to expire, perish, or die, right? Literally to expire your breath and so end. So breathe his last, Yitzhak, and died and was gathered, and he was collected to his people. Zaken. Old, that's that word for elder. Zekanim is an elder. It literally means to be a long bearded, right? It's a beard or chin. So the Zekanim were the elders or the, they were the bearded ones. It says being old and full or satisfied of days and buried him at him, Ishu, while Yaakov, his sons. All right. So I think... Um, one chapter is pretty much got us covered for the time we have allotted here, unless someone has more, but I'll go ahead and pause for that. If this is all for tonight or today, you all have a wonderful Shabbat, a great week Shavuot Tov ahead, and we will see you next time.